You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Faith, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host... Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I am your host, Stuart Deloney, and joining me as always is my trusted co-host, Ben Triplett. And this show uh, is actually a continuation of a conversation we started last week. We were talking about um, Black Lives Matter, faith, all those other kind of stuff. So if you are hearing this and interested, you can kind of go back and find it on our website, uh, www.snarkyfaith.com. And so kind of teeing up on this show, um, that may or may not have anything to do with what we talked about last week. Uh, even though we did talk about Pokemon as well, too. So I was going to ask you, because in this, again, for those of you, if any, is, if any of you are approaching the show, like for one of the first times or um, as a listener, a lot of the heartbeat of what we're going through here is we like to talk through culture, spirituality, faith, religion, uh, things that are going on um, and what it means to hopefully... Uh, be a Christian in America, and a lot of us, we have conversations about pointing out the hypocrisy of Christianity in America and other things like that. And so you could say, Ben, that we like taking a snarky, satirical, sarcastic, mm-hmm. critical approach to most things in life. Mm-hmm. Or not most things, a lot of things in life. Sarcasm. Ooh, that's still pretty That hot. is, came in pretty hot. Let me <laughs> we'll turn that down. Um... Yes. Okay. So that you would say that is true. And the way that we tend to look at stuff, I mean, I don't know, we, we're probably a bit jaded. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, there is a little bit of that. I mean, uh, there's some hope in there too, but yes. So I wanted to start this off and then, then we'll eventually get back into it because I think we, we really, we got, I, we were like on the road to meatiness last week. And I think continuing the conversation, I want to get more to application as well, because I think it's easy to talk about stuff and point stuff out. But if you're not actually like leading people in the direction to actually do stuff, it's kind of just a bunch of hot air and conversation. Um, And there's plenty of hot air on the radio today, especially talk radio in this area. Because you know what? There is no, I'm sorry, this is, okay, things I hate. Um, in, In the Raleigh area that we live in, there's really not any good talk radio. Like, I mean, I'm good to listen to music, but when I drive around a bunch too, I'd rather have hear interesting conversations. I mean, we have talk radio, we have conservative Are talk. Are you talking, you're talking more on like the mainstream level, I'm like, guessing. Yeah, not podcasting, not anything else like that. And even like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I like NPR, but some of the shows are like snoozeworthy as well too. Yeah, I've got, it's kind of sad. I don't know if I'm just not getting it, but yeah, every, sometimes NPR just feels too much like, just give me enough of like other people's culture so that I feel like connected to other people. But yeah. it, yeah, it, it just, I don't know. It smacks of something really annoying to me sometimes. Yeah. Pretentiousness. I don't I don't know if I, I call it that or I don't know. No, well sometimes. Naivete. And, oh, so yeah, I don't know. There's, it just doesn't seem to be a balance. Like I think all we, okay. So Ben, we, we were kind of coming up with a list and mine may shift or change. Um, what are things that you don't like? Or mm-hmm. hate, we can say, or hate. <laughs> Christian hatred. Yes. Oh, wait, no. is, that, is that actually an answer? Oh, no, my, okay. No, my, you want me to give my first one? Yeah, yeah, give one. I just, I, is, a little icebreaker. Game. I feel really silly about this one because I know people, to some extent, can't help, can't help it, but food noises, there's actually a word for this. I can't think, like dysphonia or something like that. Yes, you're, I think that, yeah. But, yeah, food noises, especially apples and opening like canned drinks and pouring them just, I mean, it's gotten to the point to where it almost makes me sick and I feel this like really big reaction when I'm listening to it. Um, I think probably where it gets the most annoying is where you're in a captive position, like you're in a classroom or you're in some sort of like place where you have to be there. Like you can't leave. Yeah. And someone now, if you didn't have the chance to eat lunch or something like that, I get it. But if you like had a chance to have lunch and you chose not to, but you chose to eat your noisy food 
while everyone else is forced to be around you and it's kind of quiet, that all of those things together just create a situation that like prickle me inside. And you don't understand. I have low blood sugar. I have to all the time. Why didn't you do Not it like good. 15 minutes ago? <laughs> no, um, I know. Yeah. Oh, it just, I don't know. And that kind of rolls into another one of mine. But okay. I'll, I'll let you go oh, with one. First. W- w- one stupid one I had the other day, and you know what it, no- it annoys me no end. I just, th- I think the Big Bang Theory is stupid. You're not a huge fan of Big Bang Theory. I, I'm, I'm the opposite of a fan. I, I, <laughs> I find, actually, I think most of Chuck Lorre's stuff. The guy, you know, uh-huh. what else uh, is two he and on? Ha- two and a half men. Oh um, yeah, I'm not I, a huge it, fan of that one. Where, where the humor is just so, it, it's a, too on the nose. It's, it's too obvious. Yeah, like where you can see the joke set up like a mile away. Right. And where the acting is not particularly good to begin yeah. with. But on the flip side, like what even makes me worse about like hate it even more is the fact that everyone's like, oh, my God, it's so funny. Yeah. It's so good. And you're like, uh, no, it's actually not. I think I'm kind of ambivalent towards it. I don't I mean, I just find it annoying. If someone else really wants to watch it, fine. But if they don't. Whatever. I uh, was that way about Everybody Loves Raymond, though. I cannot. I just cannot do that show. It. it which wait is that Chuck Lorre as well? Maybe. I don't know. But it, yeah, I remember. Like it's one of those shows. If I'm stuck in an airplane and have nothing else to do, I actually won't watch it. Yeah. Like, like it's that. Like <laughs> You'll I'm turn just like, away. <laughs> I will. I'll be like, uh, no. Let me listen. Like to, hide let, in a corner. Yeah. Let me just listen to people talk about wheelbarrows and NPR instead. <laughs> I don't know. The production of wheelbarrows in the small town and. The corner of the United States. Handcrafted wheelbarrows. So, okay, you want so me to go yeah, go for one? it. Go for it. Hop on in. Um, so I'll roll into my other one. It's just, I, I, I don't, it, just being inconsiderate. It, when people are inconsiderate, it really irks me. Like when you just, you know, I'm, I get that, you know, nowadays it's kind of not cool to like open doors for women. Like if men open doors for women, I, I get that there's like baggage there. But when people will just let the door like slam on someone else or when people cut other people off, especially if it's an older person, if you're riding on the bus and you like jump in front of an older person to take a seat, that kind of stuff really like riles me up. And I know that sometimes it's just you're not thinking I've done that. You know, you're not thinking. But sometimes it's obvious that you just are unaware of other people. And I'm like, come on. Like, get a little awareness of the world around you. Yeah, I mean, that would be, like, one of mine was actually right around that list. What drives me crazy is I I hate it when people treat people in customer service roles terrible. Oh, gosh, yeah. I have no skin of the game with this. I don't work in customer service, any of that kind of stuff. But, like, anyone in the service industry, I I just think it's... Because somehow you get get to this point, I'm not saying they get... I've seen other people where they... People feel... Well, actually, really, I guess the root of it is I don't like people that feel entitled. To whatever it is, yeah, um, that is really annoying. And somehow, once they're entitled, uh, it gives them free reign to treat other people as subhuman. Yeah, and that drives me crazy when I'm in lines at places or when I'm eating out and I see people treating other people. Like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're all people. Nobody's better than the other person. Um, Speaking of just which, get off your high horse. Yeah, Kelly um, posted on Facebook the other day uh, an article which I thought was really interesting about. Um, it was, I think it was. Uh, blog post and I cannot think of her name off the top of my head but uh, by a female um, wait staff that had a history of basically it's you know stop hitting on women in service positions because they're like held captive in this position like what can they do so if you're hitting on them then I mean they first of all they can get like fired or in trouble if they tell you not to um they're in a position to where like they only benefit from sort of playing into it. You know, there's just so much wrong with it that this, this person was like, you need to be aware that if you're a man and you're hitting on a woman in like a server role, then there's so much wrong with that. Don't do it. Mm. Which I thought was really interesting. I mean, definitely having Kelly uh, worked in the restaurant industry for the first like seven years of our relationship. So I, I I get a lot of the really crummy things that happen to people in those roles. It is very hard work. It does take a lot of like mental capacity and physical capacity to do. And I think a lot of people think that it's like bottom dwelling work that 
you know, only the like lowest of the low do because they can't get another job. It's just, it's, that's so far from the truth. It's a ton of hard work. Um, not just anybody can do it. It actually does take a really specific skill set. Um, I feel like I would be terrible at it. So, sorry. I had to do a little soapbox on that because of Kelly. Soapbox. Okay, so I will cut this short because I, I feel like that we've got, we have a lot of meat that we want to get into today, too. Yeah. And um, meaty meat. It is meaty meat. And I just wanted to start this off by just to quote, like I've ever heard recently from, um, and if you're any kind of a longtime listener or if you're Ben, you know I can't pronounce people's last names. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's not a spiritual gift. Um, his name is John Pavlovitz. Sure. And that's what it is. Now. Pavlovitz. Yeah, that's what it is now. Um, for now, no, but we were, this kind of ties in with what we were talking about last week. We started talking about, um, well, really just advocacy and the church and that why we don't do it very well. But, um, we kind of was like scratched onto the surface of talking about prayer. And, um, and he'd said this, he said, praying, uh, praying for God to move and still, and sitting still isn't redemptive. It's empty religion. Um, it is not about passing the buck to God. Uh, this is, this is about, um, incarnating the love of God. God has given you life and breath and gifts and resources and abundance. And if you stop hoarding them so much, uh, you may soon find that the space around you becomes less and less horrible. Um, if you dare to step outside of the laziness and selfishness and apathy, you may find that you're no longer content just to pray. You may feel burdened to become the answer to prayer. And I don't like using like the term watered down, mm-hmm. um, but maybe it's in effect. It's ineffective. Um, but I just, I just feel like, yeah, I, I just, ineffectual. I just, ineffect- yeah. I mean, I think that I, I feel like the, the way like the American church has really gone in um, and made, made like the message and like really the passion of Jesus, very uh, palatable mm-hmm. um, or very easy or, we don't talk about the things that are very difficult to talk about um, because, you know, we, we've, we've got to fit in a sermon and get everybody out within an hour. Yeah. And I think we, I think we don't allow our brains to kind of explore outside of certain boundaries. And I mean, I understand to some extent we are like bound by things um, in our thinking, but to to other extents, I think we're too bound. You know, it's like I, I know for the longest time, this is an example, it was it was very hard for me to, you know, I knew that God was supposed to be all powerful and like in all places at all times. And, you know, there are just these sort of strange rules that we're imposing on God. And, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not like on one side of the fence or another about that currently. But I do know that it's helped me to be able to think of and, and like connect um, in my like faith in a different way with God to think of him as like listening when I'm praying or, you know, something like that, where, you know, in growing up, you I, I learned at least in churches that God doesn't change like God is changeless. He's immovable, immovable. Um, but then when you pray, it's like, what am I doing at this point? Mm. Um, I'm just sort of speaking words into the air and, you know, a lot of the criticisms of the church, I think come from the mindset that that's what prayer is. It's just people sitting around like throwing words into the air. Mm. And so it's almost like feeding into that criticism. Um, whereas, you know, thinking of God in more of a Jewish way where you are arguing, you're having a conversation, you're, you're sitting down and, you know, you're still kind of like bonded to God and and you're bonded to one another, but you're also, you're bonded in such a way that you don't, you're not scared to at least say, you know, Hey God, uh, something's wrong in this situation and you're God. Why, why aren't you doing something about Mm. it? You know that in, in the churches where I grew up, you would absolutely not do that. You would have to throw out like 10 qualifiers in your prayer to say, God, we know that you know this. We know that you care about it. We know, you know, it's like defending God mm. from, from uh, you know, or defending our brains from having to think about God in a certain way. Whereas, you know, in there, I do think there's kind of like an inherent danger. You don't, uh, there is 
sort of a, a humility in not just going out and saying whatever pops into your brain. So like I said, I do think we're bound in certain ways, but I, I just think we've lost that. And, and when you're talking about things becoming sort of ineffectual or we've like toned things down so much, it's because we, we want to fit within all of these rules that we've picked up along the way versus just sort of like making it a, an actual thing like in the moment where we're talking to a being that's actually listening t- to us, if that makes sense. Yeah, look, well, actually, you said, something, you said something that was kind of curious. Um, and you were saying like th- that we have all these rules that we kind of have to follow along the way. Um, do you think sometimes like the inactivity uh, within, within Christianity, do you think it's like some of that has to do with the fact that we feel like we have to get all of our stuff to get done and together? Like we have to figure out how we're living all of this out first before we take any action. I definitely, yeah. I mean, there's definitely that there's this sort of guilt component of, and I've, and again, I'm speaking a lot of like my growing up, my like heritage and certain conservative evangelical churches Um, I know that different people have different experiences, but yeah, it's sort of that you almost feel like you can't do something because you're so like guilty of what you are doing now Mm. that it's like, I want to wait until I get this right. Or like, I feel like I need to pray in this certain way to, for things to kind of like resolve before I can go out and do this thing. Mm. Um, so, and I don't know, it's like guilt and shame become so paralyzing that, nothing ever happens. You just kind of stay in this weird cycle of, you know, I can't do anything at this point. Well, and, and I think that what, what can happen um, really for a lot of us, and I think some of it is, it's the way that we've even, we've even set up like physically church, um, you know, how, how that is even, the way it's structured, you know, comes down to the fact that, you know, I feel like that when, okay, we'll say this, we'll say the God, like, let, one thing I want to make sure that we do, and when we use words that people in churches would know what we're saying, that we actually explain what it means. Because I, I, I sat through a service a little while back, and this guy kept saying something, and I, did dis- I, had, I had two distinct thoughts. One of them was, he doesn't really know what it means. And then my second mm-hmm. thought was, everybody's nodding their head to what he's saying, but they don't really know what it means. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just something that we, hmm. they're, they're words like we hear, and, but, and they sound good. Mm-hmm. But if we don't actually unpack them and like tell people how to do them, mm-hmm. it's just like, I mean, it's like greeting cards. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that's so nice that they gave me this card that they didn't write. Right. That someone else wrote. I don't know. Um, no, but I mean, I guess, you know, you know what, what, can, what can tend to happen um, is that, you know, when we talk about, and here's the words I was trying to get to, like we talk about like, the good news, right? Mm-hmm. The, the good news. Like gospel. The gospel, the good yeah. news. Um, and and really this message this way of life this this different way of engaging the world this kind of different um hierarchy or currency that we see that Jesus lays out or like the lesser than or first you know and those you know and th- that whole thing i think that we spend too much time and i think this is also an american problem we 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 spend a lot of this time um intellectualizing it mm-hmm. like i can understand this i understand the facts i can spit it back to you i can uh, quote this or retort, you know, all this kind of other, like, I know it, like, I know all of this stuff, but I think that none of it actually makes sense until you do it. Right. Um, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's no way for you to even fully under, like, or even halfway understand these concepts unless you get out and do it. And, and the way you were even describing the way that a lot of us view God, I mean, I don't know if this is a fair, um, example, but it's kind of like playing, like, have you ever, like, okay, I do this sometimes. I I have a problem with this. Um, (laughs) Especially like confessional, snarky confessional. It is. Uh, I get some sort of a sick joy out of like torturing bratty kids. Um, <laughs> does it like if you're have you ever been around people that have kids that are brats? And you don't have to answer if that no. person's me. Um, if you're ever, but if you're ever around like people that have like bratty kids, if it's one reason or another, um, the only way I can tolerate them is to actually like subtly torture them. Mm-hmm. Like without them knowing it or without other people knowing it. Just like mess with them. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Yes. And that, that's the only way I can deal with it because sometimes th- those kids are just terrible. Um, but what I do, um, I, I remember there was this one situation where these kids and again, you know, I guess they were used to their parents, like always entertaining them. And so they were running around and they kept trying to get me to play tag with them mm-hmm. and they would run and tag me and they would run off. Like uh-huh. I'm supposed to chase them. 
And I know they want me to chase them because that's basically the universal rules of tag. <laughs> um, but what it's happens a very is... a complex game. Yeah, but I, I just I didn't move. And so they'd run around or like kind of try to hide and they'd come back because they would get bored from waiting for me to chase them and I wasn't going to chase them. Um, and they come back and go, tag! Like I didn't hear them the first time. Mm-hmm. And then they run off. And, and I feel like we're like the way you're unpacking prayer, it's kind of like playing one-way tag with God. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I have this problem. Here it is, tag. And then we expect God just to handle it all. Mm-hmm. You know, and somehow not engage us with it. That somehow that they put the correct way to play tag is that there's a, there's a, there's a back and a forth. Yeah. You know, to this. There's there is a direct there's an engagement towards playing that game. Mm-hmm. Um, I need you to play the game. You need me to play the game. Cause like one person tag really makes no sense. Right. There's like, like an expectation. Yeah. That something else might happen out of this. Not just, we're going to sit, sit here and like talk about something. And I feel like I, I'm kind of reiterating myself over. And no, over no, but no, but it is. I mean, I feel, I feel like what ends up happening is the, like the way we view prayer. We don't see prayer as like having, um, that I think, Again, I just want to clarify this. You know, that I, I'm not saying that prayer is worthless. Um, I think prayer without action is worthless. You yeah, know, because I, th- I think like kind of at least what I'm getting at, and I feel like what you're getting at is the way that we're praying is it, it's weird. It's like um, I, I feel like it's a type that it really reflects kind of where we're at culturally. And that it's very distant from what you see in scripture, even though that's what you kind of pick up on and and think that you're doing or accomplishing in praying in church. But it's very different from what's actually happening in scripture in prayer. Yeah. Because it is very passive. It's very disconnected. It's not connected to like a history of struggle or frustration. I mean, I'm thinking of like, you know, Jesus talks in parables to kind of explain himself. Um, the widow that goes to the judge and is just like bugs him over and over and over and over again because she's in a situation where that's like the only way that she's getting out of this situation. And so, you know, it's like Andy Dufresne in the, uh, in the prison that sends the letters over and over and over to get the library. He's in, he's in like a position where he's powerless, basically. This is his only option. So he's like, okay, well, you know, if this is my only option, this is what I'm going to do. Um, Which is it, a Shawshank Redemption reference. Shawshank Redemption, yeah. yes. Sorry. Um, so, you know, I feel like if you're, like, we, we're not quite in that situation in prayer a lot of times in, in the, the American church that we sort of come into a building, we all, like, feel something for a little bit, and then we go back home um, versus, like, this, we're going to bring our lives into this place and we're going to make that sort of the subject of prayer. Um, but I also want to, I want to pick up on another thread that kind of like carries over from the last show, just asking like who's in, in whose self-interest is, is this? Because I think that's another problem. Um, and especially that ties very strongly, I think culturally to where we're at in the United States. And we, you know, come from a culture of capitalism where sort of the idea is, even though people are following self-interest, you sort of assume that everyone is going to follow self-interest anyway, that that's the way the world works and just sort of let people do that. And it, and it ends up benefiting people and it gets very like weird and scientific. I think the actual um, people who write about capitalism and things like that, but I just feel like Jesus, he, he almost went completely opposite of that, that it was, he did things that were not in his self-interest. He did, he did things that were other interested. And I think that prayer, at least in my experience, prayer often is very self-interested. And I'm not, I don't think that it's, it's wrong to like bring things that, you know, because I would be contradicting what I just said earlier about being in a situation that's connected to your life. I, I think that God does care about what we're, we're in. But I also think we have to ask, you know, is everything I'm saying to God or is everything that I care about in the world about me and about the things that I'm worried about right now. Or and, by, and by me, you mean me, me. Yes. No, me. no, me, no, me, no, me personally, me. Oh, okay. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> so I, because, and, and I, the reason I'm bringing this up is that again is tied to this sort of cultural unconscious that we all feel that we should act in our self-interest, but 
at that point, we're just kind of following status quo versus maybe we can think about other people's interests. And I really, I say that mainly as a white man, um, because I think, you know, my life has definitely not been quite as hard as other people. So for me to act in my self-interest is going to keep things the way they are. And obviously Jesus did not want things the way they are. And when I look around in the world, I don't want things to stay the way they are. No, no. And you're right about that. And that ties in too, because I'm going to, I'm pulling this up on my phone. I'd I'd actually had um, somebody reach out to us. Again, we love questions, questions at snarkyfaith.com. You can ask us this. And so someone was just asking us that I got um, just recently about, you know, churches, they say we're saying they talk, and it's really weird that this ties in that well. Um, You know, the people like to say that in churches that our whole goal is to be more like Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But she was like, why why does that never happen? Like, you know what I mean? Like, we like to say it, and we say that over and over again, but why does that not happen? Mm -hmm. Um, Which I think is, again, tying in with what you're saying about this whole idea of self-interest and about action and about advocacy, because it just reminded me of, like, in... Uh, and first John, uh, what is this? First John three, like 17 and 18 says, um, if any has material possessions and sees his brother in need, uh, but has no pity for him, how, uh, can the love of God be in him? Like dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, uh, but with actions and truth. And, um, just based on this translation here, you have to also understand when they're talking about, uh, not loving people with tongue that means something very different <laughs> in the context. Hello. Yeah. Um, no, no, but but you're right. I mean, Ben. I mean, I think you're right about that. I mean, I think that there is this huge deal with self-interest and how that. I mean, I know we like to say it, it's a capitalistic kind of manifestation to some degree, you know, mm-hmm. in many ways. But you know, to some degree, I mean, I think since the beginning of time, humanity has a problem with selfishness. I mean, you know what I mean. And I'm not. I'm not saying all of it, but I think some of that. I mean, I think a that's just it's a human problem. But b, I think on top of it, capitalism feeds that aspect of us. Yeah, I think the thing that bugs me, I guess, and this is this might be just getting into intellectual problems, like first world problems. Um, but that is the starting point for so much of the way we think: is that the world is all self interested, that we're all out to get one another and creating a system based upon those assumptions versus maybe that's not necessarily the way the world has to be. Um, That that might be kind of a deeper assumption that we're not trying to dig underneath as well. Um, And again, like I'm, I'm getting this from like Nietzsche and Deleuze and Marx to some extent was, you know, these guys were like questioning. I mean, the, the Western world has thought of its world in that way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and it has produced capitalism. Um, Because capitalism is supposed to be a solution to the world is all against each other, the world is all self-interested, and this is the best way to deal with it. Um, But we're seeing like the extreme fruits of that now in the last like 10 or 15 years. Um, The, the, I mean, we have, you know, um, the wealth gap is just like ridiculously huge right now between the top and the bottom, um, middle class shrinking and all that sort of stuff that, you know, I, I can't talk a whole lot about because I don't know a whole lot of what that means. Um, Do you think the middle class is shrinking just because it's cold outside? Maybe. Oh, like with the water being shrinkage. cold? Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> global warming isn't helping apparently with the shrinkage problem. But you, I mean, we I'm have sorry, like... I'm sorry, you were making okay. a real point. Keep going. No, no, no. The, you need to lighten, bring a little levity to my rants. Ah, uh, okay, um, keep going. But, you know, and and people are commenting that political extremism has is kind of a result of this sort of like wealth gap. And so I don't know. We're not headed in a great direction. So I would like to think that Jesus offers something different than self-interest. And that's why I want to bring it up. I actually I'm thinking of an example. I don't want to bring any specifics. I do have like one or two specific things in mind when I'm talking about this, but I'm not going to say them because someone might like this book or movie or TV show or something like that. And then they'll get their panties in a bunch because, um, I'm, Oh, please, please, please. Half the point of the show is getting, giving people a reason to get panties in bunches. Well, there, there are plenty <laughs> that's, of, that's, or sorry, that doesn't work. Bo- boxers in a bunch or, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- there, there are plenty of the same type of thing. So you can probably just pick any of a lot of them are made by Disney. So, 
Um, oh. But it's just like the stories of, you know, I'm a so-and-so like white person that went into some sort of desolate situation, whether it be like a school system or, um, you know, uh, <laughs> a an, an group home or another part of the country or another like country in general. And I noticed this problem and I did this one thing to help people and, you know, and it benefited them. And those stories, you know, I'm a sucker for them. Those kind of movies and this like genre that has come about in the last like 10 or 15 years, it feeds that part of us that knows that there are wrong things in the world and that we need to do something about them. What bugs me is these people that have done these things make their whole like career off of them. And so like 20 years later, they're the so-and-so person and they, you know, they have profited so much off of it. Whereas are like how much of the, and, and I'm again, I don't want to be too specific because I don't know specifics of every one of these stories, but how much of that profit is going back to fixing the bigger problem Yeah. versus you did this one thing in this one place and now you're like a celebrity for doing it. Um, and, it and I don't know, that just like irks me because it kind of reflects this like inherent self-interest in our culture that we, even though we're helping people, there's still like self-interest at the bottom of it. And I've, I just feel like Jesus offers something very different than that. No, no, you're right. I mean, like, cause nobody wants to see a movie. Well, again, cause I, I, uh, um, you know, kind of moving back into this, that, you know, people going into situations and trying to fix them, right. Inherently is not a bad thing. Or trying to help. No, not at all. You know? Yeah. Um, but a lot of times what you're mentioning too, it ends up being like, there's the great white hope mm-hmm. that goes into a minority situation, mm-hmm. you know, um, and, and then fixes it. But also, if when you think about these in the movies, so we'll take one. I mean, I know you're, I, okay, I, I, I don't know what movies specifically you're referencing, but some of them sounded like it has Michelle Pfeiffer in it and Gangster's Paradise and other, you know, those kind of. What movie was it, anyways? You know what I mean? Uh, Dangerous Minds. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that wasn't the one I was thinking oh, of okay. to begin all of this. But, okay. Um, or, but, I mean, or, or stuff with Sandra Bullock adopting um, a board. Yeah, that was one know. that floated um, into my head. So, um, sorry, I just wanted I wanted to to, to get specific on some. You of still those you still didn't get get it, but ah, there was okay. one. There's a very specific one that is very similar to a lot of the ones you've mentioned. So. Okay. Okay. Um, so no, but with that, like, think of these 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 movies. So you have somebody come into a situation, right? Um, and oh, were you talking about the one where where the, there's like these poor privileged private school kids, and Jack Black comes in and teaches them <laughs> music? Is that no? That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, perfect. But um, no, no, but I'm saying like nobody wants to watch a movie where you're at like year 10, mm-hmm. you know, in this type of a thing. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and in that genre, and I'm going to probably ruin this, you know, you know, what movie I think is terrible within all that whole. I, Mr. Holland's Opus, I think is, it made me want to vomit when I watched it. I was like, this is so, like they put, they pulled out every sappy situation for you to like, to give you the weepies in. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm still not hitting the one you were talking about. No. Uh, but Ben will reveal it at the end of the episode. <laughs> I don't know. If you, I just, guess, if you guess it, I'll own up to it. Oh, I don't know. Okay. Um, no, because I, I have to talk about other stuff on this show because huh. I'll keep doing this. But um, no, but, you know, we like to see somebody comes in. There's these people that have a problem. This person fixes it and everybody celebrates and hugs each other at the end. Right. Mm-hmm. Like with, with these systematic problems, whether it be income inequality, whether it be uh, like race problems, you know, or well, I mean, not race problems, but I mean, folks <laughs> like we've seen in the news, uh, you know, with cops mm-hmm. killing, you know, African-American folks and you know, when these kind of problems see with systematic deeper problems like that, you're not going to resolve it in 90 minutes. And I think that like uh, our hunger for being able to consume stuff, um, especially with movies that, that need to give us the good feelies as we're watching them. Um, you know, it needs to have a nice resolution so we walk away feeling good about ourselves. You know, like like we don't want to watch it where 10 years down the line, the government funding gets cut from this. You know, we don't want to see it where the success doesn't happen right away. And I don't, I mean, I think that we do this because it doesn't feel like real life. And it doesn't, I mean, we want real life to give us quick answers. Mm-hmm. You know, you see folks that are like, ooh, I'm going to take these pills and I'm going to lose 50 pounds in like 50 days. You know, we want those. We want that immediacy of it. But for real change to happen. And, and I mean, and also on top of it, when we look at this, I mean, 
ultimately, let's take even a step back further. I'm sorry, I'm just doing lots of stream of consciousness here. Bear with me. You know, I think one of the goals when we begin to look at what is the purpose of this church is that we like that that Jesus had in this was to be able to give healing to a hurting and a broken world, Mm -hmm. right? One, I do not think people see the church as a place for healing in the hurt and broken world. Now, mm-hmm. if you ask church people, they would say yes, because they feel like they've gotten their little healing inside the four walls. Um, but really what we're also being invited into, hopefully, is a larger community of people that is a support system that is helping other those out, uh, others of those outside the church and everything else like that, too. And I think that, you know, when we, when we see what it was intended to be and we see what it is, there's a huge gap between those two things. Um, and, and I think that, that this whole idea of self-interest, and see, hopefully I'm going to make a point out of all of this after <laughs> I, I, I did loop-de-loops. Um, um, the idea of self-interest, like you said earlier, has really nothing to do with the call of Jesus. Um, the idea of quick advocacy has nothing to do with the long-term healing of the world. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd agree with everything you just said, but I will just add a caveat that kind of my point is, if you're going into it with the idea that I'm going to be able to create a career off of this, I, <laughs> excuse me, I'm, I'm going I, to be able yes, to you're right, you're right. write a book one day about this, or, you know, I'm going to be the, this person that's, that's not going to fix the bigger problem because you're still acting in self-interest. There's, it, it reminds me of a quote that, uh, Dean Smith said at some point, um, coach of UNC basketball that has passed away in the last year or two. Um, he was talking about uh, someone, a reporter came up and asked him about like doing a sit in type thing. It basically, he took one of his players to a restaurant that would not have admitted him otherwise. And I think it was something that, you know, people caught on to and said, due yeah, to, that was due kind to of a, his skin color. Yes. Yes. He was African yeah. or is African American. Um, and someone, you know, a reporter asked him years, years later, you know, that that's really cool that you, you did that and you never really kind of own up to that. It was a pretty big thing at the time. And he said, you know, if you do the right thing, it it should be because you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. You don't do it because you're going to be acknowledged for it. Um, and I'm totally butchering the quote. Uh, He probably said it in a lot cooler of a way. Um, and I'm not saying that Dean Smith is the bastion of all, or like the ideologue of, all doing the right thing every single time in his whole life. He is one of my role models, so I'm biased. But I don't know, that that kind of strikes at the heart of what I was getting at with the self-interest piece. It's that we should be doing this because it's the right thing to do. We mm. should be we shouldn't be doing it because we think that we're going to benefit out of it some down some way at some point down the line. And I think what's insidious about self-interest in our culture is that it's buried beneath things that we're not really even conscious that we're doing things out of self-interest. It's that it's just sort of like an, an uncon it's a cultural unconscious thing that, you know, it's okay for me to like benefit in ways off of this because there's a, you know, there's kind of a greater point. It's just, you know, culture is, is dangerous in that way. And the fact that self-interest is really the, almost the bedrock of our culture in the United States and in the West that, we really need to be careful as Christians because I just, I, that's like opposite of what Jesus, you know, of his starting point of his um, sort of basis. And so I think that part of building the kingdom and making change is being able to sort of wake up to the ways that our culture is teaching us that it's okay to act in self-interest and it's okay to like profit and benefit off of helping other people. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of ranting at this. No, point, no, but, but I mean, I remember, you, I don't know if you kind of get what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. No, because I okay, okay. So let's connect that point. Okay, to in many ways why we would say. I mean, and tell tell me if I'm wrong. If you don't agree with me, if you're not on this gravy train that we're moving forward here, um, one thing you know that that you're getting at, and I think some of these are some of the background steps to why we would say that the church is so ineffectual today, in many ways. Mm-hmm. Okay, self interest being one of those being a huge one. And when we begin to like, um, cause I was, I, I'd been reading an article this past week that was talking about, um, that like, when you look at like most American Christians, um, now they would disagree with the statement, but if you actually look at their actions, they 
this statement would ring true, is that, you know, that many, many American Christians would uh, trust the Second Amendment more than they would trust the Sermon on the Mount. Does that make sense? Like, ba- based upon how they, they structure their lives, how they live, and how they vote, and all this other kind of stuff. You, you following mm-hmm. so far? Okay. And, and then, um, like, the core of that piece that, that I was reading through, they, they were um, posing this question, okay? So, why... And again, and, and this is still kind of like hitting into especially like, like the violence issue that we're dealing with um, in America today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, why is, is the like, American Christian peace movement so small? Mm-hmm. Like, why is that not a thing? You know, why, why is peace and pacifism and being able to help and heal? And why is that such a small thing? And I think it ropes right back around to what you're talking about as self-interest. Yeah. Um, and, and an assumption that we're like living at peace. Some, that's somehow. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, Ben, if I'm comfortable, I'm at peace. Right. You know, like, which again, we have peace, which is self-interest again. Right. You know, because, Absolutely. Yes. Because even though like I would say this, you know, we talked about how like the middle class has having shrinkage issues. And I mean, I would say I'm not middle class um, uh, with where I'm at in, in the world. And, you know, I'm not I would say I'm probably low. low I mean, this is like economically and personally, I'm, I'm lower class um, because we Crass. were. Yeah. If you see us on our Facebook, we got called out by Trump. Um, <laughs> whether that's true or not is up to debate. But uh, if it's on the Internet, it must be true. Um, no, but so with Sarcasm. that, thank you. So we no, but with the, you know, the idea of being of a lower class, like I, I am not a wealthy person. I will probably never be a wealthy person, partially because it's not my goal to be a wealthy person. Um, but when I look at that, you know, I can say this, like I, I would say economically I'm, I'm lower class and, but I don't, I don't fear, um, the police. Right. You know, I don't, and like, it's easy to talk about the, the culture that, um, that that we're seeing, especially with African Americans, but one thing that like doesn't get like the light of day is uh, the Hispanic community. Yeah, we, um, we about, don't talk about that about b- about fearing the police as well too. Because I know um, I have a friend of mine that is a pastor of a Hispanic church, and he would say he says you know that that a lot of people don't they won't go like there's people that'll be in their church that um, some are legal, some are illegal, uh, you know, here in the United States, and they won't cross the street certain times of the day to be able to come to church because they're afraid of the police. Mm-hmm. You know, so socioeconomically, like I can be on the same level of a lot of these other people that are having issues, uh, but I don't feel that pain. Because if people, if people don't know why it's because uh, basically post nine 11, um, smaller, like I don't want to say, lo- I don't know how local, but more local than federal um, state officials have the ability to deport people um, just because of things that happened with, you know, fear of terrorism and things like that. So there, there were laws put into place for certain reasons, but this is kind of the impact that, um, I guess, non-federal um, state officials and or lower, I guess, lower officials um, have the ability to deport people. So there can be like a traffic stop you get picked up at a traffic stop and you are back to some other country than the United States. Your life is completely changed. So just to like imagine that scenario, like I'm going to go drive to the store and I'm not sure if I'm going to be, you know, come back home or I'm going to be in another country in a week. Mm -hmm. That, that is horrifying to me. Yeah. Especially if you left that country because of certain reasons that were already horrifying. Like, you know, a, a gang was beaten down your door every day, which does happen. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do. I mean, that's my, my same friend who was a, I mean, who was a pastor of a Hispanic church. I mean, I think he was from El Salvador and it was a war torn country and that's mm-hmm. one of the reasons they had to leave. Yeah. And so I, I mean, I will hear him tell stories and I'm like, I just like, I can conceptually understand what you're saying. I, I can't like emotionally understand what that is like um, right. to do that. And so I think that again, I mean, when we begin to talk about this, you know, and, 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 one of the reasons the church is so ineffectual, I think, today is, is because of self-interest, is because um, it's really aligned itself more with culture. I mean, even, even if you look at this, some of the crazy stuff that's happening, I mean, in the political process, I mean, if we're, you know, the, in many ways, like, I, I know we're not trying to harp on this, but even like, you know, how the religious right has really gotten in bed with the conservative right. Um, you know, within that, I mean, this goes back, and I know we've said this before, but this goes back to like that whole, the Constantinian, um, 
well, uh, Constantine aligning Rome with Christianity and making it the state thing. And so I think since this point, we've begun to see this. And it, why would Rome do that? They would do it out of self-interest. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, well, yeah, it's, I guess, sort of the story behind that is um, that Constantine saw that it would be sort of a unifying moment to be able to unite the church and Rome uh, because there were, there was a lot of like um, factions going on and there was violence and it was kind of a power move um, in, in that. So there were also theological reasons for other things that happened in that, but, Mm. but yeah. And then sort of bringing that into context of now, like what, what does that mean? It's, it's that idea that because I live in the United States to be a good American is to be a Christian and to be a good American Christian is to be a certain type of American Christian, which is a white one. No, I'm kidding. Well, I mean, yeah. In, in certain circles, I'm. That was it, that deserves sarcasm. I just want you to know that that was not sarcasm. Thank you. Yeah. That that absolves me of of being taken literally for what I was saying. But I also think I, I know that you've you've got a. I don't know if you wanted to bring in the um, Trump question at some point as well because it. Did Did you already do that? Yeah, about the person that was. Yeah, that that was that that was the viewer question that I had. Okay. About that was that because we had been. We had been skewering uh, the Orange Messiah. Actually, it really wasn't. It was. It was less so skewering him. It was more so skewering how um, the Republican powers that be and the the Christian evangelical power structures, you know, mm-hmm. folks, whatever machine, whatever you want to call that, um, had really just kind of let a lot of stuff slide. And who the Don? Because again, I'm not knocking the Don for being the Don. I think it's weird when we try to overly spiritualize him, mm-hmm. you know, and and put him on a pedestal somehow spiritually. Then you're like, what are you talking about here? How does that even make sense? And so the person listened to that and said, well, she was like, we had a dialogue back and forth, um, and it was really just about. Uh, Sort you know, of the if, religious aspect. Yeah, I mean, like, and some of it was American like, I think she was, she had taken it as we were just political. attacking Don, I mean, right. uh, Trump, and I was like, no, 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 we were actually really, we're attacking what's behind him and what holds him up in that esteem, and so that led to the conversation about, you know, she was saying, well, is, in, is, is anybody, are we holding anybody to the, to the standards of Christ? Because mm-hmm. nobody does it. Yeah. And, and 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 this is not about what her, which uh, what she was saying, but I it is. I mean, I think that that it's still a trajectory that we are trying to live into mm-hmm. the ways of Jesus. Um, but I think that for us to begin to live into the ways of Jesus, it requires us to give up our self interest. Is really what but, you're getting at you and, know, with that. And the re- well, the, and the reason I brought that up is it just made me think when you kind of talked about like talking about this on um, the show, just how I think sometimes it's not that I get like defensive of a certain brand of, you know, politics or, or Christians or anything like that. It's that I think some targets are really easy and it kind of annoys me in the media that you sort of fire off things. Like I'm thinking of the daily show was uh, sort of the main point of this, that, it's just to take shots at conservative politics because it's so easy nowadays. Because I really do feel like a lot of the country is moving more towards uh, being more sort of aware of other people. And, you know, we have the internet now. And it, it's just, it is kind of a sexy thing to take shots at Republicans or the right or conservatism. And the reason I bring that up, just getting back to the self interest piece, I think a lot of times we, might educate ourselves on certain topics and like other cultures or, you know, we, and, and we kind of dip our toes in things or some people go all the way and maybe, you know, learn other languages and cook food and things like that. But that carries capital with it. It carries some, some sway because, Hey, I am aware of other people, but it's still selfish. It's still self-interested. And you're kind of throwing that out there and saying, you know, well, yeah, I, I, I know that um, uh, in El Salvador, for example, we were talking about El Salvador earlier, there's like this gang, M- MS-13, that's kind of part of, uh, that's like causing the problem. And the, they had a civil war in the, I guess, 80s or something like that. Um, you know, being able to like throw things out there like that or, you know, t- kind of hitting the talking points on NPR. It's, um, you know, this happened today and I know that this many people died and, it kind of makes you seem aware 
Um, and some people really do like invest in that, in that sort of stuff to, to seem more aware of their world, but it's in self-interest. It's, hey, it's not actually making a difference, you know? Yeah. No, with your example, you, you know, me roping this back in from the beginning, you know, things I hate. Um, it's like when white people like to try to pronounce certain words to make them sound more multicultural, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, like we have tacos and guacamole here. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. You know where they throw those in? Like, like they're overly. like overly. Yeah. But like, but they throw it in like not in the entirety of what they're saying, but they're just kind of like, look, look, look at me. I'm so cultured. I know how to say guacamole. Yeah. You know? And that, uh, yeah, that, that was kind of, you hit the nail on the head for me because that's kind of what I was getting at. It's this, um, and again, it's, I think it's great. I think we absolutely need to learn about other people. I think maybe more importantly, we need to listen to other people. And I think what's so important about listening is that when you're actually listening to someone else, you, I think that is other interested. If you're, you know, really listening, if you're actively listening, um, that's a better starting point. That's why I talk about so much about, we really need to kind of invite other people to the table and let them have their moments to talk. And we need to listen because I think that that is kind of an actual uh, or an active thing that we can do that is not self-interested. Well, and, and with, with what you're saying with, with listening, um, that requires time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you absolutely. Know, I mean, we're not going to go and listen. Um, I mean, what tends to happen is you see all these, like, and we, we, we've mentioned this on, on the show and others before, you know, like where we have these, Atrocities will happen, and then we'll do something for to show like solidarity, um, either like a march or a church service. You know, like oh look, we can be rec we can be like, let's show what re racial reconciliation looks like, which means we can sing together and have a church service together. You know, and I feel like that's fake advocacy when that, when that happens. I mean, I think to to listen um, isn't always even with words. You know, it's it's to kind of become part of someone else's life as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So you're almost like listening just through life, like where I'm able to watch and to see and to do that. And you know, when we talk about wanting, um, when we talk about really wanting change to happen, what does that mean? What does it look like? Nuts and bolts. You know, with the application point. Um. And as we are getting to the last little bit of, of the show, but I think that, you know. One of the reasons, and I'm just going to say this really fast, so listen to me as I talk fast. So, you know, you'd mentioned about how it's easy for culture to take pot shots at conservative Christians. And just my only the caveat to that is that's part of the reason why we have this show is not just because it's an easy shot, but because what grieves me in my soul is that I think there's the way uh, of Jesus, there's the teachings of Jesus, and then there's like the American conservative Christian church, and they're very different. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And so I think we skewer to be able to point out the differences between those two. Because what gets me sick is when people say, ah, oh, I don't like that because they're Christians. Right. And, and my answer is usually, I don't like them either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I'm with you on that. And so as we say this, like, what are ways to do this? You know, it's easy to get outraged with what's going on in the news. It's easy to do that. But I think it's, it comes with a posture of being able to look in your communities, look around, like in natural places, like for us to go. And so certain people will be called there, you know, if there's horrible stuff happening, like in Paris or El Salvador or, or Mexico, whatever, it's easy for us to say, I'm going to hop on a plane and go down there for a few weeks to help fix this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm being sarcastic that we can fix it. You know, but I think that you need to be able to find where are those places and where are those rhythms that you can actually fit, um, reach out to people and that you can live into those places in a normal way. I mean, when we try to go leave um, our, our positions and our places here for a little bit um, to go invest elsewhere, that's fine and dandy. It's, it's good. But I think that the natural rhythms of life, it's looking for the, what are those natural rhythms where I can begin to bring other people to the table and not simply just for the table for a meal. Maybe how do we start doing life with other people that are different than me? How do I um, not have this idea that we can be like a Disney movie with Michelle Pfeiffer in it where we go into the inner city and fix these poor kids? Or, you know, or that, you know, if I am going to be Michelle Pfeiffer and try to help fix these poor kids, I'm not doing it from the starting point that this is going to benefit my career. Yeah. And I'm going to be the... Not, you know, a, not as an actress, as a fake school teacher. Right, as a school teacher that, like, you know, wrote this book or whatever. And I think that th there's the assumption, which is the self-interest thing, is also that we have nothing to learn from everybody else, but only it's, it is us from position that we are the ones that have something to give. We're giving, we're yeah. blessing, yeah. And to kind of wrap up that thought, too... Um, that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I'm totally with you on um, being able to show that Christians are more than just what is often thought of as Christians in, in the United States. Um, but also just to, 
for people not to become complacent or feel that they have accomplished something because they've taken sort of the status quo position Hmm. of saying, oh, I've criticized like, you know, a conservative fundamentalist position, but to really always be open to, well, I might be being duped by myself or duped by culture still that there might, there's something else that I need to learn or that there's something else that I need to disavow so that I can become closer to what Jesus was, you know, teaching or doing. And it's one thing to critique, but I think that at least the hope of what we're doing here and hopefully trying to like wrestle out in our own lives is simply, I mean, I think critique is important, but I think also action needs to be tied with that. Yeah, Like we'd even said earlier, prayer needs to be tied with action. I think critique needs to be tied with action as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and any, la- well, actually, we are out of time right now, Ben. Uh, so as we get to the end of this broadcast, a reminder that you can catch us on podcast at www.snarkyfaith.com. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, but that is all we have this week. And we will be back again next one to give you more. Um, that's it. We're out of here. WCOM is listener supported community radio and Snarky Faith is only possible through our sponsors. Aqueduct Conference Center was established in 1978 as a peaceful destination for small group meetings, special events, conferences, retreats, and weddings. For more information, go to www.aqueductcc.com. We are also sponsored by Lumen. Lumen, a spiritual community of seekers, sojourners, question askers, doubters and skeptics is a collective of fellow travelers that embrace the truth that all life is sacred, hope is real and tomorrow can be better than today. All are welcome. You can find more information at www.lumencommunities.com. <laughs>